A couple of bright crystal, huh? Yeah, I push back because it's just faded enough. I'm gonna leave it. Yeah. Yeah, I think it looks good. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I sent it. If you go on Ruggiero Rocky, my personal, Guadalupe Justine Sherbo. It's the most recent one. I sent it yesterday. Come on. Ruggiero Rocky, not it's the private one. Uh, Chupi, Chupi, cancelato tredici. Justine, yep. Yeah, I'm gonna start broadcasting any, or should I wait? There's a password that's Rocky. <laughs> Vado? Okay, people are signing in. Buonasera everyone. Buonasera, buonasera, and welcome. Hopefully you can all hear me. I'm simply waiting for everyone to sign in. I'm also doing some cleaning up here as I do. Okay, perfect. Thank you for letting me know. Okay, buonasera everyone. And again, we're just patiently waiting. We're just patiently waiting. For everyone to sign in. Bonnie, buonasera, ciao. I'm just looking through the list to see if you signed it. I imagine that you would have. Buonasera, everyone. Again, just a few moments of patience as we allow everyone to link in. Hello, buonasera, Mignon. Great to have you on board. I've been sitting here in the Sistine Chapel this whole time waiting for all of you to join me. Don't you just love technology? Okay, we're up to about 70 people, and it's still not five o'clock, so we'll give a bit of a cushion uh, to uh, obviously accommodate for technological issues, and this whole Zoom world is relatively new to me also. I think it's been new to most of us. I want to say that to all of you just signing in. Welcome, welcome. Again, we're just patiently waiting a few moments to allow everyone to sign in. And once they do, then I will formally begin, but it's great to see and recognize a lot of the names here who are signing in. I thank you already for joining me. Thank Bonnie as always for having me. Bonnie, it's weird not being able to talk to you. Usually we're chit-chatting behind the curtain up on stage. 
catching up <laughs> with each other's lives. And obviously this format does not allow for that. Although it was great to have seen all, most of you so recently in um, Florida, in Fort Lauderdale. Who knew? I mean, it wasn't that long ago. Uh, this is where we would be today, me sitting all by my lonesome in the Sistine Chapel and you sitting at home. Okay, we're up to about 80 attendees. Hmm. You know, folks, I'm just going to hold off on um, communicating. I see there's a hand raised. I'm just afraid if I open this up now, I'm going to reserve all the questions, if okay, toward to the end. If you are having an issue for whatever reason, what you can do is just go into that chat box and indicate if there is some kind of glitch or um, technical problem that's going on. Otherwise, again, I'm just going to hold off until the very end. I just don't, there are too many moving parts right now. I don't want to touch anything. And, Wants the computer shut off or something like that. I'm just going to sit here patiently and please uh, allow us just a few more minutes. We're up to about 85 attendees, so we're getting there. By the way, if any of you are um, wondering what's going on in Italy right now, I get pretty much daily updates. From my friends, uh, my colleagues in Italy, um, and everyone was excited because the museums were in fact supposed to open uh, yesterday, um, but did not. In fact, the Uffizi, the Academia, all the museums in Florence are still closed uh, simply because of cash flow issues. Uh, obviously, the logistics involved in illuminating buildings as large as the Uffizi are not um, slight. And so what's happened is that the mayor of Florence actually says that if he doesn't receive liquidity from the federal government, from the European Union, uh, by the end of the month, that he'll actually be turning off public illumination in the city and that obviously museums uh, are not his priority right now. So it's a very important, I think, symbolic moment when those museums reopen, uh, but perhaps not uh, the most important from a practical perspective. So they stay closed. Uh, but I do know my barber in Florence is open. Uh, if I were to land in Florence, that would be the first place I go, uh, followed shortly thereafter by my favorite trattoria uh, to get a big plate of tagliolini, fresh pasta, and some fresh peas, which are really the uh, dish going on. Okay, we're 100 strong. I'm going to wait. I have 5.02 on my clock, and I'm going to wait another three minutes to, again, allow everyone to sign in. Uh, other news, restaurants have opened, shops have opened in Italy, and they're gradually, very gradually getting back to normal. I had a friend of mine actually zoom in. Um, we're thinking about trying to do a sort of a live Zoom of Florence just so that people can see what's happening on the streets. And there were quite a few people on the streets today. Uh, they're all wearing masks. It's law that you must wear a mask if you are outdoors, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean that everyone has the mask covering their mouths. You'll see many of them just kind of with a mask draped over their ears. Um, but we did see, I saw people eating gelato, uh, people riding their bikes through the streets. And again, for the Italians, depending on where you are in the United States, um, the lockdown was pretty severe. Uh, and my wife and I have been talking about this, that when we lived in Italy for 20 years, we lived um, up on a first floor apartment. We had no backyard, no garden, uh, and where we are now. Instead, in Rhode Island, we have quite a large yard, and I can't even imagine what some of the, in, in those of you who know Italy know, of course, that you know, average apartment size is considerably smaller than what it is in the United States. And so many of them just confined um, for two full months into these rather small spaces. And when I talk to them, they're just so euphoric right now uh, for a taste of liberty. One of them said that now they know what prison probably feels like, although I'm not sure if they have Netflix in prison, but anyway. Okay, we're 111 strong. I'm going to wait two more minutes and then formally begin. Um, okay, about 115 or so. Showing 503, so another minute or two. Uh, European Union borders, the Schengen borders, will be reopening as well on June 3rd. 
Okay, and this is another major development uh, because it wasn't clear exactly what was going to happen. And there were um, sort of individual, they call them bridges that were being arranged so that uh, Germany was going to allow its citizens to travel to Croatia and Greece, um, which angered the Spanish and the Italians who had not yet opened their borders. Um, and so technically as European Union uh, constitution states, it's either all or nothing. And so they collectively have decided to open up all Schengen borders uh, by June 3rd, which is a major uh, step ahead. And again, everyone watching now um, as they cautiously return to normal life. And I don't know if any of you have been following some of our social media posts, but um, for a while back, I was sort of updating on um, what was happening in Italy. Uh, and the name actually that I use for the, uh, for the Instagram live video that I would do was Italy is the United States crystal ball, because essentially everything that's been happening in Italy then happens two weeks later here. Uh, in the United States. So it's pretty amazing. To, it's only like Groundhog Day, right? Watching it happen. And hopefully uh, this will be happening here soon as we open up. Okay, I have 504. We're up to 120 attendees, which I think is a vast majority of everyone who is coming. Um, and in fact, without further ado, I am officially going to begin my lecture. Uh, so hello to the NSU Art Museum, Fort Lauderdale, and its members, its friends, uh, and its guests as well. Uh, my name is Dr. Rocky Ruggiero. I know many of you uh, know me. Uh, and I would like to thank by be uh, beginning, thanking all of you uh, for joining me for tonight's virtual lecture, which I know is a bit of a change from what we normally do when I'm there in person. Uh, the title of the lecture is Michelangelo, the First Modern Painter and you'll see why in just a sec. Uh, I would like to thank the NSU Art Museum uh, and director and chief curator, a very good friend of mine, a dear friend of mine by the name of Bonnie Clearwater for having me here again, um, and for the opportunity to present uh, this program and for innovative partnerships such as this that bring culture, uh, history, and the humanities uh, from my living room, which is actually my office, uh, to yours. Okay? And it's a privilege for me uh, to be with all of you this evening. And I thank you, I really do, uh, for taking the time uh, to sit here uh, and hear me talk about Michelangelo. And I will be happy to answer questions, as I mentioned earlier. For those of you who signed in a little bit later, I'll be taking all of the questions at the end. There is a Q&A function on this particular webinar, and I ask that you reserve your questions for that Q&A. Okay, not necessarily on the chat because I pay less attention to the chat than I do to the Q&A. And if at any point during the lecture you have one, you can write it in. And then what I'll do at the very end is technically to um, go through the list of questions. I will read them out loud because I think that you cannot see them. Uh, and then I will attempt to answer as many as possible. So Michelangelo, the first modern painter. And I think that most of you know that in the Renaissance, the goal was to bring back, right, to um, resuscitate the beauty uh, that had been achieved in classical Greco-Roman times. And whether it was the classical ethos of a statue like this one, the Apollo Belvedere in the Vatican uh, collection, or the moving pathos of a sculpture such as this, the famous Laocoon, also located in the Vatican uh, museums. Classical art was seen to be the pinnacle of artistic expression for Renaissance artists. And so what these Florentines were trying to do in the 14th and 15th century was to bring this style back. Because this was a style that had disappeared for centuries as this paradigm of Greco-Roman art eventually dissolved into a much more abstract Byzantine style of representation. In other words, the values of that ancient Greek and Roman world really no longer uh, held true. So it didn't make sense to create art where humanity was celebrated because society at this particular point in time uh, was anything but stable. And so what we have, again, is this breakdown into this Byzantine style where space uh, becomes two-dimensional, where figures uh, become abstracted and simplified. By no means less beautiful, but a completely different way uh, to express the real world. And this style would be one that would persist well into the later part of the Middle Ages, uh, particularly in the subject of the Madonna and Child. Uh, an example of which you see here, 
which is in the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. And these Byzantine-style Madonna and Child images where essentially the Virgin Mary looks more like an alien than she does a human being. Uh, and the Christ child, whose standard age in a Madonna child painting is one, looks more like a small adult than he does a little baby, a deformed adult uh, for that fact as well. This is essentially the style that would dominate European Christian art for centuries until a Florentine painter by the name of Giotto comes along at the beginning of the 14th century. And as I've told you time and time again, we have a tendency to mutilate that pronunciation in English to Giotto. But since many of you have been with me in person and now virtually as well, I pretend that all of you pronounce it correctly, Giotto. And that when you do, you do the hand gesture thing as well, Giotto. Okay? Giotto comes along at the beginning of the 14th century and revolutionizes painting by essentially reintroducing naturalism into his works. And I know this sounds complicated, but all that means is that Giotto was looking at nature as his model and Giotto was looking at nature as his inspiration. So in a painting like this, which is in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, right, before this, the Virgin Mary and the dress that she wore kind of looked like a paper cutout doll, where essentially they were one and the same. Look how now instead the legs of Mary push up against this dark mantle suggesting that there is a real human form under the drapery, or the way her breasts push up against this tunic. So it's not just a human body, it's a female body that Giotto was painting, or the physical contact that you see here between mommy and junior. Most of the time, the Virgin Mary simply points, go back, simply points at the Christ child as being the sort of primary figure. Uh, instead here, the Virgin Mary holding Jesus's right leg with her right hand, and you can see the tips of her fingers there under Jesus's left arm. She is cradling and presenting Christ at the same time. So in a single painting, the Virgin Mary comes across as a human, as a woman, and as a mama. And this was a veritable revolution in the history of Christian art. The beginning of naturalism in art. But it would take a full century before we see the first ever Renaissance style painting. And that is the one you see here by Masaccio, his painting of the Holy Trinity, painted in 1427, and in my opinion, perhaps the most important painting in the entire city of Florence, because it was the first painting ever in the entire history of art to apply a scientific technology called linear or single point perspective. In the Renaissance, painters figure out a way to create real three-dimensional space on two-dimensional surfaces. And in fact, this was one of the achievements produced in Renaissance Florence that proved that what was happening in Florence was not just imitating the ancient Greeks and Romans, it was actually surpassing the Greeks and Romans because the Greeks and Romans never achieved linear perspective in their art. Right? The other two sort of milestone moments that marked Florence going beyond the Greeks and the Romans uh, were the construction of the dome on Florence Cathedral and the carving of Michelangelo's David, which we're gonna talk about in just one second. This is the first painting ever to use that particular tool. And consider how tricky it would have been for Renaissance artists to create a style that they could call Renaissance in painting. Because if the Renaissance was in fact the rebirth of classical Greco-Roman culture, in order to make your statues and paintings and buildings look like ancient Greek and Roman statues and paintings and buildings, you need to know what those ancient uh, precedents look like. And I think many of you know that there is more ancient statuary that survives today than we essentially know what to do with, right? The Romans produced just so much uh, statuary that an abundance survives today. So it was easier for the Renaissance sculptor to come and essentially imitate those ancient statues. If you want to know what ancient architecture looked like, you went to Rome and you could see the Colosseum and you can see the Arch of Constantine or the Baths of Caracalla or the Pantheon. But for painting, things were a little more complicated because the largest corpus of ancient paintings in the world today rest in an Italian city called Pompeii. And Pompeii was under ash until the end of the 18th century. 200 years too late. So what the Renaissance painter did was to crutch himself 
on the principles of Renaissance sculpture, the principles of Renaissance architecture, put them together, and what was produced, again, was this milestone in the history of art because they figure out a way to create real three-dimensional space. Mazzaccio's Holy Trinity, and this artist, this painter, the third member of my early Renaissance rat pack. Mazzaccio was the inventor of Renaissance painting, and this artist was the inventor of Renaissance sculpture, the great Donatello. And with this bronze David, which he cast sometime in the 1430s, uh, what you're looking at is the first freestanding nude statue since antiquity, since ancient Roman times. And this is a big deal because for the entire medieval period, statues had served as nothing more than decoration to buildings, to churches uh, in particular. Sculpture was secondary to architecture, but now Donatello is freeing statuary from its architectural background and at the same time making the statues new. In other words, in the 1430s, Donatello is going back to doing statues the way the Greeks and the Romans did, but also capturing, right? The nudity, yes, it's important that it's nude, but there's an erotic aspect to this nudity, which is a direct reflection of the 15th century Florentine society that actually produced it. Because if you're bringing back all things Greek and Roman, one of the things that came back in 15th century Florence was the practice of pederasty, or physical relations between older men and younger boys. And this statue was really the sort of iconic piece that reflected it and was originally located in the courtyard of the Medici Palace. And so I, I uh, gave a lecture last week on the Medici. My joke is that if you're a billionaire today, the three artists whose works you must have in your collection are Jeff Koons, uh, Damien Hirst, and David Hockney. You know, well, if you were in, alive in the Renaissance and a billionaire, then technically you'd have to have Donatello because his artwork was cutting edge and borderline scandalous in subject as well. And it was a work like this that opened up the Pandora's box set to mythological subject matter. Right? Donatello's David, which my students have aptly nicknamed the Puss in Boots David, and they really nailed it with that one, is very classical looking. But ultimately, the subject matter is still biblical. Right? It's David, as in David versus Goliath from the first book of Samuel. Now instead, we have Botticelli, who is introducing both the nudity and at the same time, the mythological subject matter. The birth of Venus, which many of you saw uh, with me in person uh, in Florence, which I have now not seen uh, since February. And I know that sounds like a gross exaggeration because it's not that much time, but I go through withdrawal and I'm going through cultural withdrawal uh, quite heavily uh, as we speak. I saw this when I was in Florence last uh, in early February. And people don't realize that aside from being famous and beautiful, this was scandalous. If someone walked into your home in the late 15th century and saw a large painting of a nude pagan goddess hanging on the wall, all they needed to do was pick up the phone and call the 1-800 Inquisition hotline. People have been burned alive for a lot less than this. This would be considered heresy, idolatry, and blasphemy combined. So important to mention that the patron of this particular work, in fact, was the Medici family whose wealth, power, and influence allowed them to have a uh, um, subject matter like this enter into the mainstream at the time. Very important moment. Right? Botticelli now introducing mythological subject matter. So now it's the nudity, but also the mythological subject matter that in a way justifies. It. And shortly thereafter, we have the sort of apotheosis of the early Renaissance, when in fact in 1495, Leonardo da Vinci paints what is considered to be the first work of the High Renaissance, and that is his Last Supper in the Dominican uh, uh, refectory or dining hall uh, of Santa Maria delle Grazie. Right? The first work of the High Renaissance, because technically this is where all of those technical limitations that artists had faced from the time of Giotto all the way up to around the year 1500, and now it's this perfect coincidence of form and content. Perhaps the most perfect and successful expression of perspectival space in the history of art. And now, the painting is not in great shape, but um, regardless, when you look at this, it looks like this virtual reality of a wall that has been dissolved and space that physically uh, extends past 
the confines of the room. The fact that it's a single moment of the narrative. So this isn't this sort of tableau where the, there are different episodes taking place. Leonardo distills the story of the Last Supper down to one specific moment. It was the moment when Jesus Christ dropped the proverbial bomb on all of his uh, companions that that night one of them would betray him. And so the claim that I make when you look at the Last Supper, it looks less like Leonardo da Vinci painted this and more like Leonardo da Vinci captured this. Like he was in the room that night with his camera at the ready, his spider sense started to tingle. He knew something was about to happen. And like all great photographers in the right place at the right time, he took that snapshot and immortalized it. And think about this, that this particular, when anyone, Christian, not Christian, thinks of the Last Supper, I think consciously or unconsciously, they imagine that this is actually what the event looked like historically. It didn't look like this. It couldn't be any further from this. But what happens is it's entered in our kind of collective unconscious that this becomes almost the historical representation of an event um, which looked uh, quite different. So with Leonardo da Vinci, we've reached the peak of objective representation. In other words, we're getting as close as we will in a pre-photographic world to photography. And if you reach the peak of representing things objectively, it makes perfect sense that the next logical step in visual representation would be to represent things subjectively. Okay, this is the natural flow. We've reached the peak of objective representation. Enter this man, Michelangelo Bonarroti born on March 6th of the year 1475. This portrait, which was actually, I saw this in early March, it was in the Getty um, Center in Los Angeles as part of the exhibit that fortunately I was able to get out and see on Michelangelo drawings. He was 75 years old uh, when this uh, drawing of Michelangelo was done. And Michelangelo changes everything. We've reached the peak of objective representation with Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, his direct successor. Consider that Leonardo da Vinci was 23 years older than Michelangelo Bonarotti. There is nearly a generational gap between these two artists whose lives and careers did cross over, but Leonardo was the significantly older of the two. Right? So Leonardo to Michelangelo. And already from an early age, we see that Michelangelo was less interested in representing things objectively. In fact, this relief sculpture, which is in the Casa Bonarotti uh, in Florence, was carved, if you look at the date over here, 1492, when Michelangelo was a whopping 17 years of age. And presumably it was being um, sponsored by the Medici in their own household. Supposedly Michelangelo grew up uh, under the auspices of Lorenzo il Magnifico. And the subject of this relief sculpture is supposed to be a mythological subject, of a brawl or a melee between human beings and centaurs. Lapids were the humans, the centaurs, of course, these mythological creatures that are half men and half horse. It was a wedding celebration, a human wedding. Centaurs were invited. They drank a little too much, got a little too rowdy, and things completely degenerated when they tried to steal away the human right. So this is Michelangelo representing this brawl, this fight that's taking place between humans and centaurs. Can any of you see a centaur in this relief sculpture? It's there, but you have to look really hard. Look down here. See this thing that looks remotely like a horse, hiney, and this thing extending off of it that sort of looks like a hoof? That's it. That's pretty much your only indication that there are, in fact, centaurs here. Because this sculpture, carved when he was only 17 years old, already kind of lays the foundation for what Michelangelo would do for the remaining 70 years of his career almost, and that is to focus exclusively on one subject, to see reality through a subjective lens, and his exclusive subject was the male body, nude whenever possible. Michelangelo thought it was the most perfect thing that existed. Why waste your time representing anything else? And that paradigm, the male nude form, would carry through the entire seven decades of Michelangelo's professional career. Now consider from a professional uh, point of view, Michelangelo exploded onto the scene. 
when he was only 21 years old, I'm sorry, 23 years old, and he carved the uh, Pietà in St. Peter's Basilica, which I know many of you have seen in person. It was the only sculpture that Michelangelo ever signed because it was the only one he'd ever have to. Okay? This is Michelangelo's first number one hit, if you will. And when people saw it and were blown away by it, because they never heard of this 23-year-old kid, they were saying, well, who carved it? Was it a French sculptor? Was it a Bergamasco sculptor from Northern Italy? And when Michelangelo realized that he wasn't getting his due, he climbed up on the statue and carved his name on the Virgin Mary sash. It reads, Michelangelo Bonarotti of Florence made this so that he got credit where he thought credit was due. He explodes onto the scene at the age of 23. Now consider that I always love to remind people that the common denominator, whether it's contemporary art, whether it's modern art, whether it's Renaissance art, whether it's, the denominator is humanity. We don't change. Human beings, you know, from a sort of social perspective are always the same. And there have always been haters in the world. And I always imagine that when people saw this sculpture and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So this kid really knocked it out of the park with this one, but let's see what he does next. And what does Michelangelo do next after the Pietà? How about that? How about the 17 foot, five ton apotheosis of sculptures? Arguably the greatest statue that the human species has ever produced. Now this is not a lecture on Michelangelo's David, but I think it is beyond uh, debate to claim that if it's not the greatest, then it's uh, clearly one of the greatest statues of all time. He started carving it when he was 26 and he completed it when he was 29. So just put it in perspective. Right? We're talking about the rock star, Michelangelo, who by the time he turned 30, had carved two of the greatest statues in history. If Michelangelo died at 25 after he carved the Pietà, I'd probably still be here giving a lecture on Michelangelo, the great sculptor. If Michelangelo died at 30, I'd be here talking about the greatest sculptor of all time because of the Pietà and the David, but Michelangelo didn't die at 30. Michelangelo would live another 59 years. Okay? In fact, at the end of this, I'll be telling you about a course uh, that I'm teaching on Michelangelo. And by midterm, you just can't wait for the guy to die. I mean, 89 years of prolific artistic production. The, his life is prolific. His biography is dramatic. It's just, he's overwhelming as an historical character. And his artwork, in essence, reflects that. But put it now back in context. You've just knocked it out of the park with arguably the two greatest sculptures of all time. So it's a little surprising that Michelangelo's next contract would be for a painting, right? The year is 1505. He's 30 years old. He's already almost at the peak. He thought, anyway, he was at the peak of his professional success. And he's approached by the wealthiest textile merchant in the city of Florence at the time, whose name was Angelo Doni, D-O-N-I. You see it over here on the left. Tondo, because it is a circular painting. And so the term that we use in English as well for circular paintings is Tondo. That's why the painting is called the Doni Tondo. And this man approaches Michelangelo. And think about you know, the, the personality to approach Michelangelo after the David and say, do you paint? And Michelangelo says, I dabble in paint. And he said, would you paint for me? And so Michelangelo says, sure, it will cost this much. And he threw out a pretty high price for this painting. The patron agrees, and so Michelangelo is now a painter as well. And in my opinion, this particular contract represents a very important moment in Michelangelo's professional career, where he ceases to be Michelangelo the sculptor, and he starts to be Michelangelo the, and every time I ask this, people say the artist. I go beyond artist. I go all the way to brand. Michelangelo the brand, B-R-A-N-D because it started with sculpture, now it's painting. You'll see in a couple of minutes that he would start with architecture a few years later. He wrote poetry prolifically throughout his entire career. And I am fairly certain that if Michelangelo released either a clothing or a perfume line at the beginning of the 16th century, that they would have been fabulously successful as well. Right? He was a veritable rock star and he knew how to manage himself and how to essentially play upon the success. So the subject of the painting is the Holy Family. But as I just said a moment ago, it doesn't matter what it's supposed to be. And I hope none of you watching me right now 
imagine that that is a female body. The Virgin Mary, the BVM, as I like to call her, essentially has a male body. Look at the biceps on the Virgin Mary with breasts and a feminine hairstyle. He never even tries the female form for the entire seven decades of his career. The Christ child looks like he's been pumping iron as well. This is essentially an adult male body that has been you know, trash compacted into an infant stature. Then you have Joseph squatting behind, right leg, left leg, and there's his torso. And then this wall separating foreground from background. The little guy looking up over the wall here, wearing his animal skin and holding a cross made of reeds is a young S. J.B. or St. John the Baptist, right? Older, young, those are his attributes. And can any of you listening in right now explain to me the rather unorthodox men's locker room that Michelangelo has painted into the background of this image? Folks, we're talking about the Holy Family, Jesus and Mary and Joseph in the front and the back instead dominated by these fellas having one of these magical locker room moments where we enjoy not having clothes on for whatever reason. It could not be any more inappropriate. And any other artist would not have gotten away with this. But this is not any other artist. This is Big Mike. This is the rock star. And like celebrities today, if you've transcended past a certain point of notoriety, whatever you do, scandalous or not, is acceptable. And that's Michelangelo. It happens when he turns 30. Consider as well that when he fills out the job application form for the Sistine Chapel ceiling, in the work experience bracket for that application form, he indicated this painting. This thing is all of about four feet across in diameter. That's the quantity of professional experience he had as a painter versus the just under 10,000 square feet of ceiling surface that he would paint next. I think most professionals, not artists, professionals, would be intimidated by taking on such a massive project like the Sistine Ceiling if they had such little experience, but not Michelangelo. Another part of what made him so extraordinary was his ambition. And you know, just did not cringe in the fear of a project this great. My opinion, this is the most, and this is opinion, everyone, most revolutionary painting in history simply because it changes the game. I mean, you put this next to Leonardo's Last Supper. You know, Leonardo's Last Supper looks like the photograph. Michelangelo's looks like the, two, the true artistry. I mean, there's embellishment here. There's Photoshopping here, colors that don't exist in reality, all extended over such a massive space. And again, any of you who've been to the Sistine Chapel know you can't take it in all at once. I go, I, when I lived in Italy, I was here once a week. Uh, even now that I live in the United States, I see the Sistine Chapel probably a dozen, maybe two dozen times a year. And every time you walk in, what I do, my plan of action is to focus on one specific aspect of the ceiling, whether it's the prophets and sibyls, whether it's one or two scenes up top, uh, whether it's the ancestors and the land, because there's simply too much visually going on for someone to absorb it all. And it is here that Michelangelo revolutionizes the world of painting. Okay? He began the execution down by the entrance end of the chapel, so technically the front of the chapel, and he worked towards the back where the altar is, simply because he didn't have that much painting experience. And like a true astute professional, I think Michelangelo realized that if he was going to produce less than high quality painting, the best place to do it was right at the entrance of the Sistine Chapel. Because whenever you walk into a space, your inclination is never to look at your immediate surroundings. What you do is to look down. So Michelangelo painted the less than greatest stuff directly above the entrance into it at this end. Okay? In fact, that's how I'm going to show you the scenes. Not in the narrative order in which they would take place in the story, but essentially in the order of um, execution. And we think the first scene that uh, Michelangelo painted was this. The universal flood, also known as the deluge, right? So this is the story of Noah and the ark. You see this houseboat-like looking structure in the back. These presumably are the last refugees looking for that last bit of high ground. But I don't remember the book of Genesis saying that all of these people were nude when they were doing it. 
like I said earlier, whatever it's supposed to be becomes a pretense for Michelangelo to showcase this male nude form, even when it's female. And of course, to give all of the people in this painting lifelong memberships to Gold's Gym, because they're all incredibly muscular as well. He's done away really with, any, again, one would argue it's the universal flood. The real world has been swept away by the waters. But again, you can see that Michelangelo's um, pretense here is to simply showcase that male nude form. Right. Or how about this one? The temptation and expulsion. Again, we're going backwards, right? So this is the story of Adam and Eve taking the forbidden fruit, which again in Italy is the fig, not the apple. And look at Michelangelo's interpretation of the Garden of Eden, which consists of one, two, three boulders and a dead tree stump. Stop and think about this. I think any other painter would have just loved the opportunity to paint the vegetation and the fruit trees and perhaps some birds and what have you. For Michelangelo, it is a waste of time. His obsession is with this male nude form, again, even when it's female. And notice the rather suggestive sexual position of Eve in relationship to Adam. I'm not the first person to notice that, by the way, but there it is on the ceiling of the chapel where we elect popes in the Catholic world. And then to the other side, we have the expulsion of Adam and Eve. And again, you think about that whole buildup earlier, everyone, from the Byzantine through Leonardo's Last Supper, perspective and photography. To, look at this, there's some green to indicate ground. The white is the natural color of the plaster, and then a little bit of blue to create some atmosphere of sky. It's do away with perspective, do away with landscape, do away with anything, and focus instead on that male nude form. And some would say, well, he's a sculptor. This sort of makes perfect sense. And that's exactly it. It's Michelangelo, the sculptor, who has now been transformed into Michelangelo, the painter instead. And of course, the apotheosis of the entire ceiling, the creation of Adam. Uh, stop. And the way I always teach this to my undergraduates, when you're looking at these paintings, and we've made so much of these throughout the centuries, that it's almost impossible for us, I think, to approach these with naive or unbiased eyes. You're supposed to immediately say, oh, this is a masterpiece. But no one ever tells you why it is a masterpiece. And the way I express it to my undergraduates is, think of these paintings the same way we think of film today. Because these artists are going back to the same screenplay over and over again. And that screenplay is the Bible. So Michelangelo goes back to the book of Genesis, rereads the story of how Adam was created. And if you remember the story, God scooped up some clay, shaped it into his own image, right? Technically, we are uh, reflections of God. We look the way he did. And God animated Adam by breathing life into his nostrils. Now, in addition to all of the nudity that Michelangelo painted on the ceiling, I think even for him, two grown men breathing life into each other's nostrils would have been considered inappropriate. So he reinvents the story. And what he shows instead is this listless, this impotent, literally impotent figure of Adam lying on this hillside. Where he is is not clear. The setting of the scene is not clear, but presumably he's high up. And he's idealized in this muscular form, inspired by ancient Roman river gods. And then we have God and his band. In fact, every time I look at this painting, for some inexplicable reason, I hear music. And the music that I hear is hip hop. What I imagine is God, you know these cars playing their music obnoxiously loud, God kind of doing the same thing because it's just, it's virility, it's vitality, it's life. As he comes swooping into the scene in true sort of Hollywood fashion with this extraordinarily developed physique. In fact, he looks much less like Yahweh and the way we imagine Yahweh looking grand paternal or Santa Claus-ish and much more like Zeus. He looks more like a pagan God than he does a Judeo-Christian one. And what happens is that essentially because this painting is so iconic, when most people, again, Judeo-Christian or not, think of how Adam was created, they don't think of God breathing life into Adam's nostrils. They think of this, that this is how God actually created Adam, that Michelangelo's version of the story has in fact supplanted the real literary version of the story instead. And that is true artistic and visual power to enter into a kind of collective unconscious. And that's exactly what Michelangelo does, and at the same time doing away with any kind of perspective or landscape or depth instead.
Okay. And Michelangelo also now introduces, right? now again, this is not a lecture on the Sistine Chapel ceiling per se, but I think many of you, especially those of you who've read The Agony and the Ecstasy or have seen the movie, um, know that for the entire four and a half years that it took him to paint the ceiling, Michelangelo uh, probably complained more than he actually painted the whole time. And again, I'm Italian, so I can say this. The sound of stereotypical, oh me, oh my, ing that went on. Uh, saying he wasn't a painter, he shouldn't be doing this, et cetera, et cetera. Well, at a certain point, I am convinced, again, I did not know Michelangelo personally. I want to be clear about this. I wasn't up there guiding his brush strokes uh, with every uh, stroke. But I am convinced that at a certain point, Michelangelo realized that there was an advantage that painting had over sculpture. Okay? And that advantage was expediency. Think about walking a mile in Michelangelo's shoes. This is a guy who spends a majority of his day depicting male nude bodies. Then he goes to bed at night and he dreams about male nude bodies. Then he wakes up the next day and he represents more male nude bodies. If he were to try to express even a fraction of the vast number of images he had in his mind of that male nude form in any number of positions, if he had to do that in sculpture, a thousand lifetimes would not have sufficed. But in painting, you could do it in a fraction of the time. And all of a sudden, here up on the ceiling, these smaller scenes, there are five smaller ones, are now framed with an absolute unique subject in the history of art, which is the inudo. And the inudo, which translates literally as the nude man, is using the male nude form as a decorative framing element. I mean, who ever would have thought of doing this, just having this kind of gratuitous male nudity? And every one of these figures could have been a Michelangelo sculpture in 3D. But instead, they're in 2D, and they're painted up on the ceiling, some 20 of them coming all the way down. And these inudi expressions of Michelangelo's um, simple reverence for that male nude form. By the way, look at this, the acorn here, and of course, the little peekaboo acorn there as well, all over the ceiling. So quite a bit of erotic uh, reference also. And these inudi pushing classical contrapposto to the extreme. This is perhaps the most celebrated of all, and you all know that classical counterpositioning of the body, right? Um, which is pushed here to the very, very limits. As the foot pushes in one direction, but arches back, uh, then the lower part of the leg going this way, the upper part of the leg coming this way, all the way through, right arm extending back, left arm extending forward, head going this way, and even his hair is in contraposto. And people say, well, that's just wind. No, this is not wind because there's no setting. He's outside of the picture space. He's in the ab abstract architectural world instead. Let's see if I can show him to you. Oh, back here. You see where he is? So there's no wind here. The wind is in there. This is the, the world. This is the, the vignette where the scene is taking place. These inuti are outside of space and outside of time. An absolute revolution in the, the use of the male nude form. And in fact, that influence would spill over into Michelangelo's contemporaries' artwork as well. Uh, this is one of my favorite paintings by Raphael. It's called the Madonna of the Impanata. Impanata is the oiled linen that they used in the Renaissance to frame windows. You see it in the back. Uh, and so they've nicknamed the painting the Madonna of the Impanata. And in true Raphael fashion, this beautiful Virgin Mary, this cute, adorable little Christ child jazzercising in the center of the painting. Here's Grandma. Here's uh, Auntie Elizabeth. And look at SJB down here. Isn't this kid a little too old to be running around without any clothes on? Okay, not anymore. Not since Donatello did it with Puss in Boots and then Michelangelo went sort of mainstream with this nudity. Or how about the animal skin? which again is the typical uh, attribute and feature of John the Baptist, but this Fendi fur leopard that you see down below on that nude tush of uh, John the Baptist is a little more than inappropriate, considering again, we're talking about a saint. But what's starting to happen now is this mix of the sort of pagan, the erotic, the Christian, all coming together and all of it again gone mainstream because of a guy named Big Mike. And then Big Mike turns to architecture. Okay, the new sacristy in Florence, which is my absolute favorite architectural space. We'll do this another time. This is avant-garde, cutting edge, the birth of modern architecture, but the modern architecture lecture is a separate one. I show it to you because look what starts to happen now. Look at the neck on this figure carved by Michelangelo. He's, it's almost like 
he's run out of possibilities for the male body. So he's starting to, if I could create the male body, this is how I would do it. Or how about the two reclining figures down below? Here's this figure of day, as in the work day, this Herculean monstrous figure whose body is just overwhelmingly powerful, right? Muscles in there that don't exist in reality. Or his expression of the female form of night. And again, I hope none of you think that that is a female form that you're looking at. If this woman were alive today, she might shoot her plastic surgeon as she actually walked out of his office. This is Michelangelo's vision. It's not God's. It's not the natural vision of the real world. And in fact, this spills over into the work of his contemporaries. Poor Baccio Bandinelli, who carved his Hercules statue. I think many of you know this out in Piazza della Signoria in Florence. That gray and white building behind it is the Uffizi. Uh, and when this sculpture was unveiled, Bandinelli took a lot of heat for it. In fact, they nicknamed it the Sack of Walnuts because there are muscles in this body that don't exist. And the Florentines said, oh, it looks like a sack of potatoes or a sack of walnuts or what have you. Yet Michelangelo got away with it, but his contemporaries and said were criticized for it. And again, that, that stardom that kind of characterized his entire career. And then Michelangelo would go back to the Sistine Chapel 24 years after he painted the ceiling. He would return to the Sistine Chapel again. And a comment I hear very often, oh, Michelangelo did not paint very much. Folks, if you took the ceiling, uh, which is just under 10,000 square feet, if I remember correctly, the last judgment is just under 8,000 square feet. Right? And if you took all of Picasso's canvases and sewed them together, I don't think they'd come close to the sheer square metrage of surface that Michelangelo, but it's just all in one place. It's all in the Sistine Chapel. And here, the repeat performance, where Michelangelo revolutionizes painting again. The, the, the first chapter was up on the ceiling, the second chapter is here, where his last judgment becomes again a pretense to express that male nude form. And you see it in different compartments. Here's Jesus in the center condemning down into hell. All, here's Adam, the different saints, Peter, Bartholomew, um, Laura, uh, Lawrence down below, who are all looking around. And consider that, again, all of this taking place in the sort of abstract space. Here are those souls being condemned out into hell. So there's enough of a narrative impulse that, yeah, we know what's actually going on, but it is a veritable orgy of nude forms. Again, for the 15th, or sorry, 16th century, just absolutely unique in its rendering. But consider also the fact that a majority of these saints were originally nude. Okay, now this is, if the chapel is the most important chapel in the Catholic world, this is the most important wall because it is against this wall that the Pope says mass daily. And looking up there, a majority of these figures were once nude. In fact, look carefully at the image right now. Here is a schematic drawing of all of the Photoshopping that took place after Michelangelo died. Right? One year after Michelangelo passed away, the same artist who did that portrait with which I opened this presentation was asked to go up and to paint these strategically placed loincloths jock straps, G-strings, that's an actual G-string right there, onto these figures to cover up some of that indecency. In fact, you see the blue here? This was completely repainted because the positioning of St. Blaise above and beyond, let me rephrase that, above and behind St. Catherine of Alexandria was seen as completely inappropriate. So this is where all the stuff was added. And that, in fact, is how you see the Last Judgment today. Scandal. I mean, scandalous to the point of Maplethorpe scandalous, if you're getting my drift of it. So, you know, we look, oh, it's Michelangelo, it's 500 years old, it's always been revered. That's absolutely untrue. This was as scandalous as Last Tango in Paris. This is as scandalous as any of the modern art pieces, which have caused ripples in society. And that's the point. That's what art does, right? Art is supposed to take us out of that sort of comfort zone. And the curious thing is that there was one particular man who, in fact, said that this was inappropriate for a religious setting and more appropriate for a brothel or a tavern. And Michelangelo responded by actually painting that man in down here as Minos, as this donkey-eared assistant to Satan. And this is not something we discovered later. This is something that was well known in its day, and that is the kind of political power. In fact, this man, he was the papal master of ceremonies. He formally protested to his boss, Pope Paul III, and Pope Paul said, I think it's pretty funny, we'll just leave you down there. I mean, it just, again, to break out of this reverence, the solemnity, and to make it more of a kind of contemporary human drama. Michelangelo I 
modern painter. And in fact, what happens now is that his contemporary, younger artists like Rosso Fiorentino, right, would give birth to this movement called mannerism. And like in the description that you saw for this lecture, mannerism is the first ism in the history of art. A group of artists who essentially have a kind of collective objective to do things in a certain way. And Rosso Fiorentino was one of these mannerists, right? Where you're looking at a painting, and I think you all recognize the subject. It's Mary, it's Jesus, and presumably various saints with these angels down below. But what is going on with the running mascara on the Christ child? What is going on with the punk rock John the Baptist with that flaming orange hair, that running beard, the fact that they don't fit into the frame of the painting? All of a sudden, you know, Michelangelo broke the rules, so now we can all break the rules and the birth of mannerism in the 16th century. So depicting conventional subject matter in unconventional ways. Not that different from what later modern artists would do as well. Right? And again, it's amazing when you study the history of art, how you watch that wheel turn and sooner or later, it all comes back. The old becomes new again. Uh, one of my absolute favorite paintings, and I'm not a huge fan of ma uh, mannerism, but the Capone altarpiece, in Santa Felicita in Florence, where essentially, you know, what is going on? Well, he's, oh, there's Mary, there's Jesus, All right? So, but what is, again, when you study Renaissance art, there are a whole set of rules that we follow. We'd love to put stuff in boxes. That's what art historians do. And so when you walk up to a Renaissance painting, you start asking the questions, who are they? Where are they? What are they doing? Well, who are they? Jesus and Mary. Can we identify anybody else? No. Uh, these kind of look like angels, but they don't have wings, which would be the traditional attribute. Where are they? No idea. There's not a blade of grass, a rock. There's one cloud, and you see it's being illuminated from the left-hand side, but the actual window in the chapel where the painting is located is on the other side of it as well. And what's going on? Well, there's no cross. There's no, it doesn't fall into. So the idea that one great Renaissance art historian called it a bouquet of sorrow, that there's an abstract subject here, which is you know, a kind of deconstructed pieta, because it's moving to see a woman holding her dead son for the last time, but the true sledgehammer of emotion comes when they take that body away from the mother, and she knows that she's never going to touch it again, and I think you get that feeling here. So emotion becomes the subject, a sort of almost subjectless painting. Right? Again, kind of like what some artists would do, simply trying to reproduce the effect of life. Where's the moral in Monet's painting? Where's the anecdotal history in this? But where's the mythological? No, we're just looking at something that's aesthetic, which was unheard of in previous centuries, but again, the old becoming new again. Or now looking at reality through a lens, just like Michelangelo did, and enter another of these mannerist artists, this Parmigianino, an extraordinarily talented artist uh, who seemed to be battling with PTSD in the later part of his life because he happened to be in Rome when it was sacked in 1527. And you're seeing this intentional distortion of human proportions, particularly in his women, the Madonna with the long neck for pretty obvious reasons, but also long fingers, this disgusting child lying across her lap with that big bald head. And I still remember seeing this painting for the first time in 1993 as an undergraduate and immediately evoked the work of a more contemporary artist by the name of Modigliani, who was essentially doing the same thing. Michelangelo was the first modern painter because Michelangelo was the first painter to see reality through his subjective lens, to see it his way and to push that way into the mainstream and opening up then the door for his uh, contemporary mannerists. And then later on again in the 19th century uh, for the birth of modern art, okay? With that, I'm gonna officially end the lecture proper. If you bear with me from just one sec, I know many of you have been asking what I've been up to these days. Uh, I'm actually beginning, uh, this is now my second online art history course, if any of you are trying to figure out ways to uh, whittle away the hours. Uh, this one will start on June 22nd. We'll be focusing on Michelangelo, six weeks, uh, meeting twice a week, okay, on Mondays and Wednesdays. Uh, the first section is at 11 a.m., and then for working people who can't make it during the day, I'm offering a second section at night at 6.30 p.m. as well. Again, all of this uh, information is available on my website. You see the um, 
information there. You can take a screenshot of this if you like. Uh, I'm presently in week two of another online course called Italian Art and Architecture. And if any of you are interested, again, just contact us. We'll be more than happy uh, to fill you in. Uh, I know many of you listen to the podcast, but if you're not familiar with it, uh, we had two real um, stellar podcasts in the last couple of weeks uh, where I interview my good friend uh, and technically former student, uh, Dr. Peter Weller, who many of you know as the actor who's interpreted RoboCop, uh, in addition to many other things. He now holds a PhD in art history from UCLA and Renaissance art history in particular. And so those were the last two podcasts that were recorded. Uh, you'll find this series any, everywhere, Spotify, um, iTunes, Android, iHeartRadio, et cetera, et cetera, as well. Uh, I have a new documentary out, if any of you are interested. This will be airing on PBS in um, July, but is available uh, for streaming on my website, a 28-minute documentary on Florence, all shot on site in the city of Florence. Um, and is my tribute. I, in fact, I finished filming this in January of 2020, this year, uh, and we've been able to put it all together, uh, fortunately, and get it into documentary form. Okay. So with that, I will now open up to questions. And so I'm going to open up the Q&A here. And if you want to write the questions in, feel free. And again, what I'll do is actually then read uh, the questions out loud. I have a raised hand. I'm not sure how this works. I think I'm going to ask you if you could to just type the questions into the Q and A. It's in that bar that you have. Oh, okay. First question: Was Michelangelo openly gay? Uh, the answer to that question: Was Michelangelo openly gay? Is no. He was not openly gay. Was he gay? <sighs> That's a complicated question. Uh, and I defer that to a former colleague of mine named Michael Rokey, who's essentially written the only volume on homosexuality in the Renaissance, uh, which is called Forbidden Friendships, Homosexuality in the Renaissance. Uh, and chapter one of his book essentially says that we can't define men as gay at this particular period in time because homosexuality was not the same kind of construct by which we define it today. Um, consider that was sort of <laughs> what I was alluding to with that Puss in Boots David earlier. Um, consider that close to 75% of Florence's male population was engaged in same-sex sex, sex um, during the Renaissance and they didn't call it homosexuality, they called it sodomy. Uh, and the curious thing is that even openly heterosexual men were practicing it. Uh, and the rules were very well uh, and clearly established. Um, if you were younger, you were the passive partner. If you were older, you were the active. And after 26 years of age, you're supposed to get married, and it was all supposed to end. I mean, we don't know much about his um, sexual life, um, but he wasn't openly gay, if in fact he was gay. Okay, next question. How do you think Renaissance painting might have changed if they had access to Pompeian paintings? Excellent question. Uh, and in perfect honesty, I think that not having seen the Pompeian paintings was an advantage to Renaissance painters because otherwise it would have been just more or less a formal, I think, imitation of the paintings in Pompeii, which are quite beautiful, but again, lack that piece de resistance, of course, which was a linear perspective. I find it amazing, though, uh, when you look at Botticelli's Birth of Venus, and I know many of you have been to Pompeii, there actually is a painting of Venus standing in that Venus pudica form, how similar they look, uh, knowing fully well that v um, Botticelli never saw the Pompeii fresco. It's a pretty extraordinary thing. So again, I think that it may have actually held Renaissance painters back had they been exposed to what I like to define as a more primitive, probably not the word, uh, but a less developed, let's say, style in uh, Pompeii. Right. Okay, considering it's also 1,500 years earlier. Okay, next question. Uh, did he have, I'm not mentioning your names, and just for the sake of privacy, I'm not sure if you want me to, but I'm not going to. Did he have a large workshop or a large studio to help him with all the work? Uh, the answer is no, okay? Uh, it was convention, it was tradition for artists to have a bottega, um, a very structured workshop uh, with the maestro and then apprentices who would work 
and usually the apprentices were paying the master for the professional formation that they would gain. Uh, Michelangelo tried it uh, when he painted the room that I'm sitting in right now. Um, he tried it. He actually had a group of five painters come down as a workshop. It didn't work out. And then Michelangelo would promote the idea that a bottega was the stuff of artisans, that artists did it autographically, that it had to be by the hand itself. And in fact, he became rather dismissive of people like Raphael at a pretty large and organized um, workshop uh, in his home. So the answer is no. And the only formal labor that he would outsource would be manual. So we have payment receipts to people who would bring blocks of marble, <clears throat> excuse me, to his studio, who would help him in the more gross um, parts of the actual carving and or painting. Okay. All right, I'm moving on to the next question. Thanks for today's lecture. Is your video on Florence available for repeated viewing or one-time viewing? No, uh, the, the video, the documentary on Florence, essentially what you do, you pay for unlimited streaming. Okay, you get a code, you, I think you have to log in or what have you, and then you can watch it as many times as you like uh, in streaming format. Okay, so it is unlimited viewing for the Michelangelo documentary. Uh, follow up, he loved the male form so much, why did he make all men so muscular yet poorly endowed? Uh, believe it or not, there are many, many people who have asked me that question before, and that is of the a relatively small size of the male genitalia. That is actually a throwback to ancient Greece and Rome, uh, where they saw conservatively sized male genitalia as a reflection of culture and civilization. Okay, the idea that we're so civilized that we can actually control and restrain our libidos, uh, whereas excessively large phalluses were typical of barbaric representations, right? You're savage, you're animalistic, you're bestial, and you have an oversized phallus, technically speaking. So that, <laughs> that point, I know a lot of you are making jokes right now, but that point, no pun intended, um, was in fact intentional for that reason. Okay, next question before I dig a hole too deep to get out of. Is the Sistine temptation and expulsion from the Garden of Eden has anyone ever commented on the fact that the serpent has two tails, one from each thigh that coil around the tree? And so the question regarding the uh, serpent that's coiled around the tree in the temptation and expulsion painting from the Sistine ceiling, and the answer is absolutely yes. And it's really difficult to figure out where they end up. If you look at it carefully, that coiling two that eventually sort of dissolves into one, which is kind of an odd thing. It's an anomaly that I think he did intentionally. It's sort of a visual um, tongue twister or eye twister or whatever you would like to define it. Okay. And then lastly, I have gratitude to you. Now, gratitude to all of you. I really, really appreciate uh, you taking your time. Um, as I explained to everyone, these sessions have become sort of therapeutic for me uh, and keep my hopes up again in these difficult times. So everyone, really, thank you so much, Bonnie. A big, big hug. If I were there and not contagious, I would give you a big abracho. Uh, I'll save it for the next time that I see you, and hopefully I'll be back in Fort Lauderdale soon to see all of you firsthand. Okay. Have a great night, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy, uh, and stay smart as well.